Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we've got Benjamin B. What's happening, everyone? And we got Dr. T. How's it going, everyone? First things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one that you choose to use, and thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, it's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. Right, Ben? Yes, sir, Tom. <laughs> right, T? Yes. Do you prefer T or Dr. T? I like T. Oh, okay. I think that's pretty cool. T. What up, T? <laughs> I feel like I still have to call a doctor. I just feel like when you've earned that, like it's like a respect thing for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. But you guys are like my brothers, so. Yeah. But I respect that. So thank you, Ben. I'm going to stick with T. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so how was your Christmas, everybody? Good? Mine was good. It was quiet. It's what I needed. Quiet, laid back. Yeah. Pretty much sums it up. Did you eat some good food? I ate a lot of good food. What'd you have? Maybe you should cut that out. Billy might be listening. Oh, <laughs> uh, No. I had spaghetti, blue cheeseburger. That sounds delicious. Some lobster bisque. Was this all calamari? Was this all homemade, or you went somewhere? A uh, combination of both. Okay. I had some peanut butter cup ice cream. Yikes! That was good. Yeah. All right, Billy, have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about you, T? I worked yesterday, so it was great. It was good to see the the patients and the clients and their gratitude and. Yeah, I got to hang out with my family at night, so it was the best of both worlds. That's good. Yeah. Speaking of that, I looked at the pictures. So we get shift reports mm-hmm. here, and I didn't get to attend this year, but our clients had a blast. Yeah, at our Christmas, yeah. our our staff is so awesome here. Yeah. Shout out to them. That's Definitely. why I brought it up. They're yeah. the best. They are. They're the glue that holds us together. Mm-hmm. Do you see my new sign? Did where'd you get that? My wife had that made. Aw. Yeah. I don't know from who or where. Somebody out in the acreage, out by me. Yep. You that people was... out there out there in the swamp are pretty crafty. Yeah. That was uh that was um my Christmas gift. That and a portable or a small refrigerator that's <laughs> on my desk. That is yet to get my LaCroix cold, but give it time. Yeah. Your wife is very thoughtful. Yeah, that was a good gift. So. It was very, it looks really really good. And if you can't see it because you're watching on or listening on a podcast player, I encourage you to go to YouTube and search Real Recovery Talk and then you can see the sign and let us know what you think. Um all right, well today I think uh we kind of decided that we're going to talk primarily about alcohol and the I want to stick in particular to the detox process of it. Okay. Because a lot of times there's a lot of misconceptions around alcohol detox. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people that have this idea that they're going to detox themselves Mm -hmm. and it can be very, very (sighs) dangerous. And so we encourage people to not do that and uh, in fact, seek medical um, treatment or assistance in some capacity. But obviously, we're going to get into the weeds. And this is probably going to get broken down into two different parts, because there's a lot that can go into it. So um, if you are, in fact, struggling with alcohol, or a loved one of yours is struggling with alcohol, this is definitely going to be a good one to listen to through the end. And we'll give you some action items at the end of stuff that you could do, uh, or, you know, some takeaways. And in the end, obviously, you can contact us and we'll Walk you through the process regardless of the situation. So how's that sound, Ben? Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Is that a good intro? Yes, sir. The the third intro, really? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so Let's get rolling. All right, T. So somebody calls up and they said, Listen, Doc, I'm drinking way too much. What do they do? <laughs> well, most of the time they won't call me, uh, but if I do get yeah. them in there in my primary care setting where this is all probably where it's going to take place, uh, the first thing we have tools that we've been taught where you can do brief questionnaires with the patients 
Um, you know, an acronym that's used, it's called the CAGE questionnaire. Have you ever had to feel like you have to cut back on your use or felt guilty uh, about your use or had like an eye-opening experience, maybe a DUI, maybe a motor vehicle accident, or maybe a family function where things just really got out of hand, where you feel like, you know, something, you try to engage the patient and ask them those type of questions. Let's let's just repeat that one more time. So it's CAGE. It's an acronym. C is for cut back. Have you ever had to cut back? A is for just, it's just there as yeah. a filler letter. <laughs> uh, G is guilt. Guilt. Have you ever been, have you ever felt any guilt or shame around your drinking? And E is, have you ever had an eye opening experience or what we also would call consequences? I, or it could mm-hmm. be consequence. Mm-hmm. So, all right, go ahead. And then go ahead, Ben. I was going to ask, what are your thoughts on whether or not people are honest on those or whether or not they're even capable of seeing like their own truth, so to speak? That's the, the difficult thing. Obviously, if they're coming into the office or they're calling in, it's going to be a different conversation. Mm-hmm. But one of the, you know, screening, like, I don't know if you've ever gone to a primary care doctor recently. No. <laughs> <laughs> I need to. But they're trying to push a lot of these um, questionnaires. There's also a, a questionnaire, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but there's an Audit C, um, and you know people can Google what's an Audit C. But basically, the nurse will ask the patient before they get to the provider, and it asks uh, them like how on how many days this week or in one day have you had more than – um, you know, four drinks for a female, um, four to five drinks for a female or three to four drinks for a male in one night. And then that kind of opens the door because if someone says yes to that, then obviously it's contextual, right? If you were like, oh, on a Friday night, I went out and I had a lot of drinks. But if they tell you, well, I have like three to four drinks every single night of the week, uh, then that's a conversation that you need to start trying to engage them in and ask them more about and elicit more information because they may not necessarily think that it's a problem. Uh, but as you speak more and more with them about it, that's when you can get more in depth about it. Now, what if now, cause I hear three to four drinks a day and I think to myself that was, I did that every day for years mm-hmm. and it never really was a problem. Um, what what quantifies from a medical perspective a problem? Because, I mean, and I don't want you to, like, bash the medical system. Obviously, it's it's there and it works. But three to four drinks a day, to me, is nothing. Like, three beers after work? And if I do that even seven days a week, is that really, from a medical perspective, like, too much it is technically they have so getting into the nitty-gritty there's alcohol misuse and then there's alcohol use disorder and when we classify patients into having a use disorder there's 11 criteria and these 11 criteria you know it goes into the (coughs) i don't want to get too much into it but we can maybe do that on another episode, uh, but it goes into like the consequences that they've had. They continue to use despite, you know, all of the things going wrong around them. So these 11 criteria, and if they meet two to three of the criteria, then they're considered a mild use disorder. And okay. So it's like a tier system. It's a tier system. Okay. But if you screen positive on that initial in one day, I've had more than you know, four to five drinks in one day, that's already considered misuse. There are guidelines out there that state that it is a misuse. Wow. So that's more of an educational thing all around. Yeah. uh, Because a lot of the general population misuses alcohol. Yeah. Let me ask kind of a related question. I'm just curious. From a medical perspective, do hangovers, the more you drink, get worse, like with age, so to speak? Is that... Like a progression? Is there any science behind There's that? There's no scientific data behind that. I just think it's as we get older, we're just more vulnerable. You know, when we're 18, yeah. 19, 
underage drinking, 21, we're ready to, we can just bounce back, yeah. you know, but as we get older, you, you get hung over because you're dehydrated, you, you feel worse, but there's not really any scientific data behind well, that. Like just what we were talking about, like I, I always think about the progression because we see clients here that they drink for years, those three to four, five drinks, whatever, on a daily, and then all of a sudden one day, 10, 15 years later, and I, I would think like it's because they start feeling worse or maybe their body doesn't metabolize it as well anymore with age, and next thing you know, they their hangover's worse, and they're like, you know what, I'll have a drink in the morning. And like I think it just can quickly go from misuse to an AUD, alcohol use disorder, like overnight almost, I feel like. Once you cross that line of having a drink in the morning to like get rid of the symptoms, I think you're crossing a line mm -hmm. big time. There were very few times where I actually drank in the morning, um, but I would take benzos in the morning, which mm -hmm. was essentially doing the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. That's a drink, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, but, you know, the, I think the, the vast majority of people that we work with and probably listeners of this podcast, either themselves or somebody that they know, far surpasses three to four drinks daily criteria. I, I, I'd be hard pressed to say anybody that comes in here that's a true alcoholic that, you know, identifies as an alcoholic. And I mean, we do all the pre admissions here and I can't tell you anybody that says, Oh, I'm in treatment. And what's your drug of choice? Alcohol. Okay. How much do you drink in a day? Oh, three to four drinks a day. No. I've never once had that happen. It's always like but, a whole bottle. Right. But a standard drink like for exactly like for medical <laughs> guidelines is one ounce of like liquor. Yeah. Uh, four to five ounces uh, or four ounces of wine and then a, a beer. Um, so these are standard pours <laughs> or standard. That's what I'm saying. Like so, it's who drinks one ounce of liquor. And who measures right. it, right? It's so Applebee's does with their little jigger. <laughs> right. <laughs> but if you ask a normal human being, anyone that's not in treatment, like, you know, what they will drink two to four shots a night. Yeah. Just as like a nightcap type thing. Well, and, you know, but the fact that there's a, a criteria system, like, obviously, if you're listening to this and you have three drinks a night, we're not saying that you you're an alcoholic by any means, right? You know, no. it's, it's, it's something that, you know, if you go back to the cage acronym, uh, does any of that resonate with you or somebody that, you know, um, and I think that's the biggest, the biggest component of this is it's, it's, it's less about the amount of alcohol you're drinking and it's more about everything else mm -hmm. in your life. So let's get back on track Go ahead. I want to rewind kind of back to the very beginning of what we were talking about because you mentioned very rarely you take the in, like initial phone call. Tom and I do. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of tie this into levels of care, so to speak, and, and medical requirements yep. and kind of the role that I, I take on the phone or Tom does. So there's two substances where as a facility we absolutely require detox. We have made very rare exceptions to this. But generally speaking, there's family involved that's like literally watching these people like a hawk and they haven't drank for days with no symptoms of withdrawal. But if I get a phone call from the alcoholic themselves, alcohol and benzos are the only two like you have to go to detox and I'll have them on the phone try and convince me, oh, I only have three, four drinks a day like we're talking about. But unfortunately, I can't take that at face value. You know, I have to assume three to four, like you're talking about with the amounts, mm -hmm. you know, their idea of a drink is a whole bottle of wine. Right. And they're like, like, I have one drink and yeah, it's a whole bottle of wine. Exactly. So, hey, you know, you just never pour it out of the bottle and that's one. Right. But I want people to understand too, like the reason that we require that is A, people aren't always honest mm -hmm. or they minimize because we'll have people call us and be like, for whatever reason, like they like the sound of our program. And they're like, I want to do all this working out, all the all, all the twelve step stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to look at it from a liability perspective too. Like you, we have to at least get you medically cleared at a detox level of care, and 
we we go back and forth with people about this all the time and and I'm like the detox might only hold you for two or three days if they literally can can point out and show that it's accurate what you're reporting is accurate right and they'll discharge you me- and medically clear you mm-hmm. or you end up having a seizure or shakes or whatever the case is and you end up there for a couple of weeks and I've seen both you know so I kind of wanted to touch on that I always tell people on the phone like per our licensing standards we are required to make you go to detox and th- I pretty much stick to that what's y'all's thoughts on that well, I think, and before we started recording, we talked about, I think there's two components, and T, you'll get into this, the, the in, more the inpatient component and the outpatient mm-hmm. component. So let's just stick with the outpatient, because I think this is uh, rather interesting, and it's it's uh, it's at face value, it's probably going to be the less or the um, more risky of the two. Mm-hmm. Uh, so outpatient detox Go ahead and describe what that would look like for strictly alcoholic. Okay. So outpatient detox really falls under two different scenarios. Scenario one would be uh, the primary care physician. So whether it's a family practitioner that they have a really good rapport with or, you know, an internal medicine physician, either one, they're providing primary care for the patient. And at, and that particular person, one, they have to be comfortable with alcohol withdrawal and managing alcohol detox on an outpatient setting. I will say 95% of primary care physicians probably are not comfortable with that. Psychiatrists can also do it too, right? Addiction psychiatrists and just general psychiatrists are capable of doing it. And usually what that looks like is you go to the doctor you talk about, you know, one, they look at your medical history, right? You have to make sure the patient doesn't have any acute medical issues that would run any type of risk of hospitalization or, you know, compromising their medical issues. You also have to look at their mental health issues. You know, are they suffering severe depression, anxiety? These are the two main things you have to do a health history screen with before you even talk about doing the, the, the detox outpatient. Once you've gone through that screen, the physician will say, okay, we're going to try to do this in the outpatient setting. So they'll write a prescription for you uh, for benzodiazepines. So it's, either, it's probably going to be a long-acting benzo like Valium or Librium. Um, sometimes patient people use Ativan too. And they will give you, let's say, a seven-day prescription of medications. They send it to the outpatient pharmacy. And you will then go and follow the directions and take those medications at home. Now, with that being said, um, that you can either go back and see the physician every day. Some people require it. Or some people can do like a telehealth call every day with their provider or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant to check in every day, but someone has to check in on the patient every day. How are you doing? What are your, they use a score called, it's called CIWA, C-I-W-A scale to assess their withdrawal symptoms. And it's a, a questionnaire. And at the end of the questionnaire, they get like a score. And based on the score, they can kind of determine with also if they're telling them I'm having tremors, sweats, anxious, I can't sleep, Um, they can tailor the taper to those um, symptoms. The difficult thing about doing that is for me, from my perspective, is you don't have eyes on the patient. You know, with alcohol withdrawal comes severe high blood pressure, high heart rate, so tachycardia. Um, You know, they get overexcited. They can't sleep. You want to make sure their medical conditions are controlled as much as possible. It's really hard to do that if you just go to a general physician. So the outcome of those type of detoxes is usually the patient will get uncomfortable and then they'll just drink and and say, listen, I I really couldn't do this. And then you have to kind of go back to the drawing board on that. I, I, one of the things that I think one of my gripes, I suppose about an outpatient 
detox uh, in particular for alcohol or any any substance uh, for this matter is obviously alcohol withdrawal is very uncomfortable. I went through it myself. It's it's shitty. Nobody. I don't want anybody to have to go through it. Um, the medical model, though, addresses exactly that the physical symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. It doesn't address anything else. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think people have a severe uphill battle when it comes to doing it on your own. It's bad enough you have the health consequences of trying to do it on your own. Does the benzos or the Librium or the Ativan or whatever, will that prevent you from having a seizure? It will. That's the the point of it, right? Okay. Is one thing we didn't talk about is like the pathophys between alcohol, like the neurobiology briefly is like when you drink alcohol or you use benzos, your brain doesn't know the difference. Your brain works on a checks and balance system, right? So you have your GABA receptors and glutamate receptors. GABA is like the depressant of it and the glutamate is the exciting part. So it's like on a teeter totter. So what happens when you drink? When you drink, you suppress the exciting hormone, the glutamate or neurotransmitter, sorry, and it's coming down, right? It also suppresses GABA in your brain. So everything is depressed, right? And you're, you're not really in homeostasis anymore because everything's suppressed. When you rip off the Band-Aid and you take away alcohol and you take away um, the benzos, your glutamate system revs up. So you get this overexcitation. And when that with overexcitation comes the high blood pressure, the tachycardia, the sweating, seizures, DTs. So what comes in and balances that homeostasis? It's benzos. That's why we use benzodiazepines for the detox process because it helps bring the brain back into a slow homeostasis where you taper them down very slowly and controlled so that way they you don't have a seizure. Like that's the goal. I we learned in school that the term cross addiction, benzos and alcohol are the only two families of drugs that you can truly be cross addicted to. Mm -hmm. One's interchangeable for the other, basically. Mm -hmm. There's no other family of drugs like that, if mm -hmm. I understand correctly. Correct. Yeah. What about like in my situation, I was, I was severely addicted to both of them mm -hmm. when I went into detox. Yep. What did they give me? They gave you benzos. Did they? And yeah, I'm sure oh, okay. they did. Um, I mean, that's the only thing you can use to detox patients. I know they were just giving me naltrexone. Well, naltrexone's the anti-craving medicine for yeah. alcohol. So that's not it's not involved in the detox process. I feel like the thing about it is benzos are very measurable, too. You know, they come in different milligrams, and you can really taper so to speak because you hear people try to taper themselves at home off of alcohol yeah by drinking and like it's one like, less drink it, it, there's no scientific yeah rhyme or reason behind that but they also use like phenobarbital but that's more we'll talk about more that's more used inpatient than it outpatient it's mainly just benzodiazepines yeah it's a barbiturate phenobarbital mm -hmm. is a barbiturate yes so I'm, god i'm glad that earlier you brought up like that it's just purely the medical side of it. Cause I I'd like to share like some of the phone calls I've gotten. And obviously I don't get to see the other side. Cause if somebody went to a, a general practitioner, like, and they were successful, I'd never hear about it. Right. So I can't really speak to that. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to pretend like I know something I don't, but at the, but on the other end of that, a lot of the phone calls that I do get, somebody's calling in, seeking help for alcoholism and they'll share their experience where, Hey, I went to my general practitioner. Mm -hmm. They gave me a prescription, a clonopin or whatever out of to come off. And the fact that it only addresses the medical side and not like the other underlying issues, mm -hmm. the habits, the daily routine that comes with drinking that generally speaking, the situation actually ended up worse. They're like, Oh, I, I ran out of my meds early cause I took too many mm -hmm. or I took mm -hmm. those and still had my drinks, which actually makes heightens your tolerance and makes it worse. But that goes back to like, just as a very simple example, like if, if Johnny goes to work every day, nine to five, yep. but part of his routine is I stop at the bar at five fifteen for happy hour. Now he has this benzodiazepine that he's supposed to take 
but that doesn't stop him from stopping at the bar. Like it's something that filled his day every day, part of his alcoholic routine, so to speak. It's hard to break those habits. It's not 100%. like yeah, just here's the pill and and that's why going back to what you're talking about, Tom, like all the all the therapy with it, the having eyes on them, like you said, Doctor T. Like withdrawal so management is technically a medically managed level of care, right? That's what they teach us. But ideally you would want it to be if you do have a primary care doctor or or it be in a multidisciplinary clinic where there's a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA, but there's like a, a mental health counselor mm -hmm. there that can check in with them daily as well. Like you want a whole team um, to take care of the patient. Just I meant to, to mention that too, where, cause you just mentioned the check in daily. Do they have places where like you show up for your dose every day? So yeah, that segues into the other outpatient management, withdrawal management or detox is there are new facilities coming up and you'll, I haven't seen many down here in South Florida, but I know out of state there are, they're called outpatient detox clinics where essentially they, that's all they do is outpatient detox, not just for alcohol, but for other substances. And um, patients can admit directly to the clinic, but it's outpatient. So they come, they check in, they do their initial screen, they see the provider, there's a therapist there, you know, they have that support staff there. Then they'll give them their medications, but only 24 hours worth. So they have to come back to that clinic every single day to keep getting their prescriptions to take. But also they have nurses there to check in with them, to do their vitals, you know, to do basically what an inpatient setting does. But more so the patients can go home, they can go to work, they can still function kind of in their daily lives if, if that's what they want to do. I got a question. It... Are doctors protected like in some sort of way, being that like all this stuff is self-reported? Say, for instance, I'm a doctor and someone self-reports this and I'm like, you are appropriate for me to send you home with a, what, a week long prescription of benzos. And then something happens to them. They have a seizure, whatever the case is, like because it's self-reported are, are you protected in some sort of way? Because the liability just sounds high. <laughs> it's very high. And that's why so many... That's why there's that stigma with it, especially with alcohol and benzo withdrawal, because they hone into you in early education. What's the one thing that can kill a patient? Alcohol withdrawal and benzo withdrawal, because this, they can have a seizure, they can aspirate, you know, they can have respiratory failure, they can go into florid DTs and never come out of it. What's that? What what was that called? Flora? No, I just florid, like severe oh. DTs. Oh. <laughs> I okay. was wondering the same time. So yeah, severe DTs, and you know that's what's you have to trust what you're doing, and you have to be involved. And if you don't trust that, and you're not involved, then you put yourself, well, you you're putting the patient at risk too. I just feel like if I was a doctor, I wouldn't want that risk and liability. Well, especially knowing what we know. I mean, I, I understand, and this, I think, goes back to the educational piece in terms of doctors. There's not a lot of Dr. T's out there that are educated to the point that you are and understand the rhyme and reason behind addiction because, you know, we it's easy for us. We do this every single day. We know that it's there's so much more involved than just giving you a prescription of Ativan and sending you on your way and saying good luck. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't have done that to me. That's for damn sure. I would have taken those things in the first couple of days and then been like, okay, well, now what? You know. And the thing is, is if I want to drink, which I did this, but for like, you don't have to take the pill. You know, it's something that you're you're given way too much, uh, honestly, responsibility. You know, somebody that's a true alcoholic. That's a lot of responsibility to undertake for somebody that 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 probably can't do it. I think the patient has to like one has to really really want to to do it and to be sober, but sometimes 
you get scenarios where patients are just so resistant to like going inpatient or going into the hospital that you have to say, okay, I'll meet you halfway. Let's do it your way. Right. And let's ride this, you know, wave together. And Until let, you crash and burn. And let them figure yeah. it out. And sometimes they will figure out, great, you know, that's the goal we want them to. But, you know, obviously the other side of that is they will crash and burn and you have to help pick them up and get them situated. That does have to be, because we talk about this with doing interventions, like a lot of times the outcome isn't exactly what you want as a family, like on the front end. Right. But it comes back to, we have a saying, you have to let people have their own experience, mm-hmm. have that aha moment. Okay, we try this your way, but when it does crash and burn, let's make an agreement now that we were trying it your way, and next time we're doing it our way. Mm-hmm. And it, it's just part of the process, unfortunately, but sometimes fortunately too, mm-hmm. because then they can't go back on that either. Which the next step, and I think we cover this in... Uh, part two is going to be a, if outpatient detox uh, hasn't worked for you or somebody you know, next step is inpatient. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to cover that now because I think there's a lot that goes into that as well. Um, but I, I would say, though, even all things being equal, if you could go either way, inpatient's the way to go. Hands down, 100%. You know, I agree with that. We'll cover cover that next time. All right. Did we forget anything about outpatient? Mm-mm. It's not a good way to go if you if you if you can avoid it. It's tough. It's tough on like if if someone's alone and they don't have support or social support, you know, or fam- family support. It's really really difficult. That's yeah. a good point because you brought this up several times. What? resources does somebody have i do feel like outpatient may have its benefits as far as somebody not having the resources i'll call it what it is most treatment is pretty expensive Mm -hmm. you know so maybe that's the best that can be done because you always ask that question before Mm -hmm. prescribing somebody Mm -hmm. something what's your budget can you afford this every month yeah and the family support and then also yeah if they're homeless that's you know outpatients may be the way to go for them, you know, limited medical complexity, limited mental health complexity, uh, the working patient, you know, very high functioning people, fortune 500 companies, you, you know, they are stressed out. They drink a lot. They can't afford not financially, but to lose time from work and all those things to go inpatient. Those are like your ideal outpatient detox, alcohol detox candidates. Yeah, and I, I I think it is worth saying that you could do that uh, outpatient detox, do it quicker rather than, or is that the right phrase? Quicker rather than later? No. Now, sooner, ra- sooner <laughs> rather than later. <laughs> sooner rather than later before you get to the point where, you know, it's, you get, full blown. Right. Um, and it sounds like the criteria is very minimal, you know, mm-hmm. three to four shit. I would have qualified for outpatient detox at probably 14. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I think there is, you know, I, yeah, there is going to be a time and place for it, but, uh, you know, I think inpatient is going to be a good way to go for those that can, that can, uh, make that work. So a couple of resources, obviously, um, Outpatient, you that's a quick Google search. You could just Google search any outpatient alcohol detox mm-hmm. facilities. Um, any, it, you know, a primary care physician. Is there a database that people can access or no that that would be able to? They'd be better off, like, there's no database, but they'd be better off, you know, searching for addictionology physicians, addictionologists, or psychiatric uh, physicians or, you know, psychiatric addictionologists. That okay. Kind of stuff. Or you could just call us or email us and we'll walk you through the process. And obviously, you know, 
couple that with some sort of support program. If you are in fact going to go the outpatient route for detox, or if that's something that you feel like uh, could be beneficial for you, it's highly, highly encouraged that you get involved into some sort of support program, whether that's Alcoholics Anonymous, Celebrate Recovery, uh, Smart Recovery. Again, you know, we're 12 steppers here. We believe in it through and through, but uh, anything is better than what you're currently doing. So that's what I would encourage and, and get and talk about it. Don't feel, don't feel ashamed. You know, obviously this isn't something that you're going to be able to do alone. So right, Ben. Yes, sir. Tom. All right. Is that it T that's it. All right, Ben. Is that it, Ben? That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Real Recovery Talk. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, it's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see you all later. Bye. See you later.